Hello everyone, welcome back. This is lecture four of our computer vision. Today we're going to introduce the feature extraction and more specifically we will introduce what is the features and the quantization to get a feature and the metrics like the distance and the seminarity and also we will introduce a global and local feature and give each of them some examples like the color histogram, LVP and SIFT. Let me raise a new question before we start. Look at those images. How do you group them? You might think, oh, this is easy. Because we can group the image based on what we see, like the first one we have the yellow here and blue eyes, and the white skin. Second one, uh, there are black here, brown eyes, and the yellow skin, and so on and so forth. This is so easy for us. Let me put this into a table so it's easier to see what's happening. Our observations are just based on uh, what I put in a header, the hair color and skin color. And different examples are just have different uh, characteristics of these two uh, dimensions. However, this is just a representation of how human beings see it. Is there a way that computers can see it? Yes, there is. We know that computers know the numbers on it. So we can give each of those characteristics uh, a number. Actually, uh, we're giving, we're assigning each of those colors a number, uh, for example, we gave yellow a 2, and then we will have the ace, and we gave the white and 1, and we will have 1 here, 1 here, there, and we also can do that for black by assigning an, uh, 3 to, to it. So this process, converting the uh, characteristics we see into numbers called quantization. So you will see after the quantization, those are all numbers uh, which computers can see it. Great, seems now we can build the grouping rules by using the if else for branching. For example, if equals to 2, we know that is it's yellow if it equals to three, it's black, something like that. It's right and wrong. The reason is the yellow, black, and white is actually belongs to a system uh, which is discrete because the human understanding about the colors are discrete. So we can give the name to each of the object we see. Um, to identify its colors. So, um, however, from computer point of view, the colors are continuous. The reason is those colors are usually captured by sensors, and the sensors are always with noise. It um, turns out there are some uh, variants or noise uh, there come with that number captured by sensor. So it would not exactly be two, three, two or something like that. So in that case, because of the noise and the variance, we can't use the if else. So the computer way is consider those representation. I mean, take each of a row uh, like this as a vector. Uh, we will call them feature vector. Um, uh, hereafter, and, and let's see what they are exactly. The idea is quite straightforward. Um, let's see, here is a table we have, and for each of the objects, uh, we have two numbers there. One is for hair color, the other is for skin color. So we will take each row as uh, we have introduced as a vector 
and actually it's taking those two numbers for a row as a coordinate uh, coordinates in a space. Uh, that is to say we will take the first number as a coordinate for this axis and the second number as the coordinate for this axis. In this case, each of the examples or samples can be put into this space because they have coordinates in this space, then they take a position in this space. After doing this for our images, we have them represented into a linear space we call them feature space. And those two, these coordinates are, uh, I, we call them uh, feature vectors. So uh, recall your knowledge from a linear algebra. This, the, the feature vector is actually something like this from the origin uh, to the actual position it taken in that space. So this will help the computers uh, to understand those samples better. Um, so here is what it is if we rip uh, represent all images we have into the feature space. Uh, we are supposed to see something like this. Now it's quite intuitive and straightforward for us to see uh, the groups now. Uh, you know, uh, here is one group, here's another group, uh, here are some um, gap between groups there, and inside that groups, uh, those uh, samples uh, distributed uh, close to each other. So, seems the grouping can be done by just teaching the computers to draw the circles. That's really a good guess. That's what we teach in this course. But let's start from something simple and straightforward by teaching the computers to tell the similarity or difference. This is a feature space we have, and we know that each of the samples are now a vector inside that space. And recall what you have learned in the geometries and linear algebra. And there are actually a lot of ways to um, help us tell the similarity and difference between the vectors. Since the samples are vectors right now, we can use those methods to evaluate or measure the similarity or distances. The first one is the inner product. I think you're quite familiar with it. And it's actually calculating a summation of multiplication of their corresponding uh, coordinates of values at each of the direction or dimensions, and yeah, like this. Um, if this value equals to zero, we see those two vectors are independent to each other, actually they will be perpendicular inside that space if you have inner product zero. So that means um, if the larger the inner product is, the more not independent they are, non-independent they are. That means they are correlated in some sense. Um, so we can use this value to indicate something uh, like seminarity the two of these two vectors. However, you will see this multiplication doesn't consider scales. In case there is one vector uh, really long, much longer than the other, so you are supposed to have a really large value as uh, for their inner product. So this will affect it by the scale of vectors there. Um, so the better way or more commonly adapted way is to use the so-called cosine seminarity. It's, um, uh, it's something like here, you calculate the inner products and then divide it by their norms. Um, so you you have the cosine seminarity. It's actually calculating this theta. That means the 
angle between that two vector, uh, you know, it the the smaller the angle is, the closer the two vectors are. That means more similar they are. So when they are overlapped to each other, um, the theta will be zero, and you have the cosine similarity one there. If they are perpendicular to each other, something like this, uh, because this inner product will give you one zero. So the similarity between them will be uh, zero because this is perpendicular and which gives you a zero seminarity. So we can use this cosine seminarity to tell how similar two um, vectors are, two feature vectors are. You will see this doesn't um, affected by the scale because um, even you could have one vector really long, but by dividing its norm, um, this will eliminate um, the contribution of the uh, scale. So that's the reason cosine similarity is widely adopted in computer vision and actually in the other machine learning related areas. The other one is also really popular, and I guess you're familiar with it. It's called the Euclidean distance. Geometrically, it's a distance between these two positions. And in geometry, we calculate the distance like for each of the dimensions, we calculate the distance between um, the coordinates of two um, points, then we take the square of them, and finally we calculate the square roots of this summation, and that's the distance of x and y. Uh, here is x, here is y. So, uh, but you can consider it in different way. Uh, it's equivalent to this. Uh, this is actually, if you consider x and y, um, the subtraction of x and y is actually a vector from here to here, like shown in um, here. So if you calculate the inner product uh, of this vector, it turns out it will be the equal to that distance. So uh, either way, you can, I, I think you can um, take either way. Uh, to, as an explanation for Euclidean distance. Anyway, it, that's it's straightforward as well. Okay, after here, you might already realize that uh, we can actually tell if two samples are from the same group or from the different groups by just mirroring the similarities or distances. That's correct, actually. However, it's just too early to do so. So far, we just assume there are some numbers and we know they're from sensors. However, from what sensors and how to get these numbers, that's the part we haven't introduced. Actually, uh, in last lecture, we know there are uh, pixels for each of the image. For each of pixels, we have uh, uh, three numbers uh, for R, G, B. And there are a lot of pixels in one image. That means we got a lot of numbers for an image. And how uh, could we do something like get the uh, specific numbers we want? For example, for the hair part, for the face part, uh, the skin part, I mean. So, is uh, the actual process of feature extraction, the one we're going to introduce today. Simply speaking, the feature extraction is a process for converting an image into a set of numbers. That's the feature vector we have introduced, which will tell some of the characteristics about the image or our perception about that image. 
So um, there are actually global features and the local features there. Uh, global features consider the image as a whole, uh, like um, our perception about color, shape, and texture, like the overall skin color and overall hair color. Those are global features. Um, uh, but by contrast, we have the uh, local features. Local features tell us the details, like uh, what the ices will be look like, what the uh, uh, mouses or nails will be look like. Uh, those are uh, lo local features or point feature or pixel features there, and you will see them very soon. Um, here we listed some representative features for each of them. But due to the time limitation, we will take the color histogram, LBP, and shift as the examples to introduce today. Let's start with the color histograms. Color histograms are used to represent people's perception about the colors of images. Um, recall the example in lecture two uh, where we uh, introduce this as a warm image that uh, is actually about the perception about people um, the color are more warm than um, cool than other images there so uh, using image precision we have transferred this image into a cool image but the cool and warm information is just people's cons um, perception about the colors um, but with the color histogram we're able to let the computer know um, it's warm or cool more specifically we're actually um, doing some statistics on each of the channels of this image um, to get a set of numbers to represent them. So that's a co color histogram when we put them together. Um, to introduce a color histogram, let's start with the histogram itself. And because each of the channel as we have introduced is a gray image. So let's, with, let's start with the gray images. Here are three images, for example, where in the first column, we have colored images. In the second column, we converted them into gray images. And in the third column, for each of them, we generate a histogram for them. The histogram is generated uh, like this. We note that the uh, in gray image, the value of the pixels are in the range of 0 to 255. Then we take each of the volume, for example, 0, uh, to check out how many of the pixels uh, are uh, in the vo volume of 0. So um, then we use that number of 0 value the pixel, put it uh, to create one point here. Then we repeat that process, for example, uh, when we are using the value of 50 um, to count how many 50 valued pixels in that picture. Uh, by repeating this process, we can create a set of um, points in which uh, composed this curve and we call it histogram. And this histogram is actually about the composition of dark pixels and bright pixels in that image. For example, here you see we have several pixels there, and this, the first one, is corresponding to the darker area of that image, so you, uh, which probably corresponding to the pixels in this region. And also this one probably corresponding to brighter regions in that pixel and probably for uh, they are from here and uh, last one is the brightest area uh, which probably are from here so and in the second example uh, we have uh, two sets 
of pixels actually. One is the foreground, it's a mouse and it's dark, which corresponding to this part. And the second is the overall background. So it's created a peak at here. So, and, and the third one, almost all of them are dark pixels. So you only observe one peak in that histogram. So by checking out uh, those three examples, you will see that a histogram, um, I mean, a histogram for gray images are actually telling you the composition of the um, dark and uh, bright uh, regions of that image. And those information uh, can be perceived by people and through the set of numbers the computer can perceive it as well. So this is a um, histogram for gray images. With the histogram for gray images in mind, the calculation of color histograms are uh, straightforward. As I mentioned, what you have to do is just consider each of the channel as a gray image, then repeat the process I just have introduced um, for each of the channel, then you can put them together to create three histograms for that color um, image. And uh, actually, you don't have to use uh, uh, 0 to 55. Uh, I mean, you don't have to use each of the value as a bin. You can um, create a wider bin like uh, 1 uh, to 10 as one bin. So when the pixels fall into this range, you uh, put, you count in uh, this band, they put them the pixel in this band. And also you can, uh, uh, the next band are uh, probably uh, 10 to 20. So in that case, pixel with values in that range will fall into this band. You can repeat that process for all events in data images. Um, then you have the histogram and especially for uh, when you have done it for each of the channels, you have this colored histogram. Um, here we're using the same three images in previous example to demonstrate the color histogram, um, but this time we're using the color uh, ver version. So you can see in the first column, it's for the gray image. Uh, which we have seen in previous example. In the third column, we calculated for each uh, channels, um, uh, for each channel a uh, histogram right now. So you, you see three curves for each of uh, the images. Uh, right now you could see there are some peaks and um, the, there are red and green peaks there, which probably coming from this uh, region. Um, and we have the dark region, uh, pretty large, actually. Uh, they provide peaks uh, at here. You could see um, this actually are telling you the composition about colors. And also for the second image right now, the background uh, most are from here. Uh, I'm sorry, the background are not from here. This is for the mouse itself, and this is for the background with um, almost the same um, color. And but a significant difference is observed for the third example compared back to its green uh, histogram. There is only one peak, but right now we have. Uh, three pixels there observed uh, because even those pixels are dark. Um, however, they, com they come from different colors. Right now, you could see there are some um, uh, are more red color uh, from here, and also there are some blue uh, light. Uh, regions and uh, contributing uh, different pegs there. Anyway, through those examples, you could see the color histogram can actually tell us the color composition about the images at the same time because there are numbers 
the computers can perceive it as well. In addition to the colors, people perceive an object through um, its surface as well. Um, uh, more specifically, the surface is made up by different materials. The material has its patterns. So those patterns can tell us what the object is made of. So we call this feature texture features. By extract text features, we can help the computers understand what kind of materials the objects are made of. So in this case, we're going to introduce the LBP, one of the most representative text feature extractor, which is proposed by Professor Marty. And it has been applied to different um, domains in computer vision, like uh, the face description, medical image analysis, and so on and so forth. And th uh, for those, we will introduce it later. Anyway, it's classic, so we picked it up for today. And here is the original gray image and its LBP feature map. You could see that its LBP feature map uh, is with the same size as the original image. However, for different regions composed by the same material, we could observe something like the same pattern, like this skin area like especially you look at this area for the mouth they are with very similar patterns there and for the background you could see they are with very similar patterns there in the lbp feature map so that means the lbp can tell us the texture information of an image let's see how we can have the lbp feature map uh, generated uh, with the convolution which we have introduced in lecture three, it's easy to understand the LBP. Let's see, we have an image, and we have a filter uh, three by three, which we slide it on that image pixel by pixel to investigate the pixels covered by that filter. Uh, that window for investigation. Uh, for example, here are nine pixels there. And here is the value for the pixels there. And then LBP is actually comparing each of those neighbor pixels. I mean, the values of those neighbor pixels to the data of the center. So the, here is a decision function. You can do the comparison by just subtract uh, these two value. So if that value is greater or equals to uh, that central pixel, that means the, subs the result of subtraction is greater or equals to zero. We put a corresponding position as a one. Then we repeat that process because it's greater than there, we got a one. And we re repeat that process, uh, you could see a lot of ones there. And uh, then up to here, when you compare this 40 to 45, because less than that central uh, pixel, we got a zero. This is what uh, this uh, is telling us. So we, we continue to have some kind of zero. So here you could see, actually, this divide the pixels into different types. So um, this is local. A representation about the texture. Then you have this zero and the one representation because right now we have eight neighbor pixels. We could concave those numbers into just one byte because there are eight of them, eight neighbor uh, composed of uh, one byte. So one byte is exactly the uh, computer used for images representation. So that should be in the range of 0 to 255 as well. So uh, in that case, after the calculation for all the pixels on that image, we uh, can create a value for each of the pixels as a result. 
then that's the reason you see in previous example we can put all those values together and we have another image which is with the same size as the original image representing the texture information about that image we call it a feature map um, uh, the process is shown here and for each of pixels we uh, slide the filter on that image to investigate the nine pixels um, uh, by comparing the surrounding or neighbor pixels to the central pixel create the zero one patterns for each of pattern you can get them together so you have a value there then you can put that value to corresponding position and repeat that process for all the images there and you could have a feature map lbp feature map which is another image uh, representing the texture information about the original image and we can uh, do a step further by generating a color histogram because the color histogram is a, a statistic process which can give us a feature vector for an uh, image it would be easier to, uh, uh, than just use this feature map as a feature uh, because uh, this is more representative um, so it can be read by the computers in fact, in previous example, we are investigating a 3x3 three three region of the image uh, for every pixel. But indeed, you can extend the idea by comparing the pixels at different directions. For example, uh, let's see, we can compare uh, the central uh, pixel to eight directions there. So you would uh, model it as a circle so you can generate the very similar LBP representation and also you can use a larger radius and you can do it like this and you can actually generate a more detailed representation by dividing further this dividing each of the direction into finer scale then this will give you um, 16 values there and you can use that zero one patterns to compose another number which can uh, when it's finer it will tell you more details about that pixel and here are some examples and it's actually for the same three image we have used for the color histogram and so you could see the LVP their feature map, uh, LPP feature map is telling us the, the composition of textures. For example, you see this is from the same material, which will have similar patterns there. And those are from the same material, very similar patterns there. For the second image, and the mouse are from uh, made of the same material, so they should have the same pattern. And the background is, should be a, a, a desk, and they have very similar pattern. However, there is a little bit difference of the background. Compare this part to this part, even they are same material, but you could observe they are with different patterns there. Uh, so in uh, for that, we we have different uh, types of feature map generated for that regions, and this is the third one is for the dark images we have. The LBP is telling us um, those background, the dark background, they have the same pattern, and those regions have the similar pattern uh, generated there. Anyway, you could see from here, LBP feature map are able um, uh, to telling us the texture composition about the images, uh, which with that, the computers can understand the texture and also indirectly about the materials of the objects in that image. 
Okay, the color histogram L LBP are straightforward, but let me give you more examples like uh, shown here. Can you use the color histogram or LBP to tell the difference between those images? Uh, probably not. It's not easy uh, because they are composed of very similar colors and also uh, with very similar textures. The reason is the color histogram and LBP are actually global features as we have introduced. They consider the images as a whole. To tell the difference about the previous images, we have to tell the details. So in that case, we need local features like the shift. Shift is a really representative method for extracting the uh, lo local features of images, or you could see the details about that images there. Um, and here are some example actually. Uh, each of the point are actually are extracted by the shift algorithm. So you can actually find the correspondence between those points there, like what's shown here uh, to here, and like what's shown here to here. They are corresponding to the uh, specific um, region of that image and so um, that is to s say that shift is able to represent the local features and details about the image rather than just roughly considering the images as a whole. With that being said, uh, let's see how shift is doing it. Actually, uh, you don't have to worry about this part because it's, it's kind of complicated compared to color histogram and LBP. And if you don't care about the details, you can skip this part. Just remember SIFT uh, is one uh, feature extractor which can help you to convert the image into another set of numbers which um, represent the local or detail information about the image. So for those interested to know the details, and uh, let's continue to introduce how SIFT is doing it. Actually, there are two parts of SIFT. One is detection, the other is description. Detection is to find the key points like we have shown in previous slides. Um, those key points for each of them, we will generate a description like a feature uh, vector for that point one by one. So um, in that case, there are four steps here. One, we have to estimate the location and the scales of each of the silent feature points. We call them a key points. Then we will refine the key points from the candidates. Then we estimate the orientation of the key points. Then we build the description for each key points, as I mentioned. And the final description is called the shift descriptor. Okay, let's get in to more detail. The first step is to localizing those key points to find the candidates of the key points. Um, again, we are using a convolution. I said it's quite important, but here the filter we're using is actually a Gaussian. Uh, don't be scared by those formula. If you check out it, um, it with the Gaussian, the normal distribution, you will understand what it is. Um, the way of the key point localization of shift is actually apply different uh, Gaussian filters on the same image and to find uh, and then to find out the difference between the results. And through that difference, we can find which one are more silent than the others. And we will use them as a candidates for key points. And that's the idea of um, key point detection. Um, so uh, you will see that uh, we are actually, this is one um, 
convolution, we are using, we are applying a filter, Gaussian filter, on an image i x y. X y is the uh, coordinates for the pixels, and then for each of the uh, position, we can apply this um, a Gaussian filter, and it's the same as the convolution. But um, the only difference is the filter itself is different. And there is another thing which are very special is we don't have to apply the, com the fil Gaussian filters directly on the images, I mean, respectively. This is two filters uh, where we're using the sigma to control uh, the shape of that filter. Then uh, we don't have to calculate uh, respectively uh, using this to filter on the original image. Rather, we can use the difference between these two filters to do another convolution on the image, which will give you the same results, by um, uh, which is equivalent to applying the filter on that image, respectively. So this is one trick used for key point localization, um, and this process of find the difference between um, the result of the Gaussian filtering is called DOG, stands for difference of Gaussians. Um, let me give you more detail. So as you can see, um, the Gaussian filter is with a bell-like shape. So by controlling the uh, sigma, you could make it with a sharp peak, or you could make it more smooth. So um, anyway, it's create the filters in different shapes. And here is a more specific example. Um, the, the 2D filter, I mean 2D Gaussian filter, is with numbers uh, like this. And its corresponding shape will be something like this. By controlling the sigma, we can control uh, is it a sharp peak or it's with a smooth surface there. So by applying um, this Gaussian filter on that image, and as if you recall what we have introduced in the image filter filtering, it's actually using those number as weight as weights and multiply back to the pixel it covered in that image. That means when you're investigating an area here and here will be multiplied to here and here to here. And um, for that window under uh, investigation, the multiply will be done by the convolution and uh, the summation will be done by summarize the result together as a number, then put it back to the center, the results, which create a value to the central pixel. This process is actually uh, doing uh, summarization um, on the pixels. So it's like the main filter, it will kindly blur, you see, the blur that's image a little bit. When it is sharp, sharp, I mean the peak is sharp, that means the contribution of the central area, uh, the pixels of the central area will be greater than uh, those far away um, regions. When it's smooth, the contribution of the central regions and um, the rest part of that filter will be more even than those with the sharp peaks uh, filters. Then um, you could see with different shape of filters, you will have the image blurred in different degrees. So. Now you probably are wondering why we have to blur that image into different scale. And here is a set of results by blur the image into different degree, where we actually have control the sigma uh, to change the filter. So it has been blurred into different degrees here. You will see the uh, when the scale uh, becomes uh, greater, and more, um, the more significant the, uh, the blurring is. Um, so 
to understand why we have to calculate the blurred image and why we have to calculate the difference of this blurred image, um, we can think it uh, like this. Uh, here is something like we look at that house and trees from really far distance. So we can see only a blurred shape and we don't know uh, what it is, but we can perceive some shape from there. So then we walk closer to that object. So it's like uh, in the scale of 64, we see some detail, we start to see some detail, but we don't know what exactly they are uh, because we don't have the details. Then we walk closer and we start to see some details. This is window and we realize this is a house. This is um, a tree. And then we walk closer like here, like here, we start to see more details. So this blurring process at different scale is like a simulation uh, we observing the object at different distance. So in case some of the details of the object is stable or silent and we should be able to see it at certain distance and um, so even there is a little bit of variation of that distances and we should be able to see those points like for example we see uh, the shape of here we see the shape of here and here uh, with those consecutive scales we can uh, see the same a very similar thing. That means this um, point is kind of stable or silent for those three scales. And for the same reason, and we should be able to see some of uh, the uh, point on a window at certain distances. That means the points on the windows are also silent for that distances or that scales. By calculating the difference between those um, um, simulation of this uh, distance observations, we are able to find those key point candidates. So you can take that explanation in this way. It's more intuitive um, to see why we have to calculate the blurred image with Gaussian and also why we have to calculate the difference. So here is more example uh, with a cat theater and uh, the difference of Gaussian DLG has been calculated. You could see that some of the features are very stable at certain distances at certain scales, uh, like here, like here. And when you go to different distances there, the other points start to appear uh, very stable. Uh, things those are silent points at a certain scale. We can pick up our key points from those candidates in that case. And uh, what exactly happened is we are actually uh, varying that sigma in different scale as I mentioned. Then for each of them, we can calculate the difference between the Gaussian filters directly, then we know the difference. Uh, we don't actually have to apply them to the image one by one. So this is more efficient there. Then we have the differences that created for different scales of that image. Then we can pick up the local maxima and minima of, of that differences there. So uh, because they are because they are extreme of uh, that difference and they should uh, be the silent um, points uh, and the corresponding to the silent points of that original image so we can take them as the candidates for key points in that case and here are some results you could see we actually identify some of the candidates from that object on a building and um, they, they are quite they make a lot of sense uh, you can see it here rather than taking every pixel as a candidate 
However, uh, the step two, we have to remove some of the candidates because some of the candidates are at regions with the low contrast. That means they are quite sensitive to noise. If there is a slight change of illumination or um, your viewpoint, and it will be affected a lot. So we have to remove those candidates uh, from um, the candidates we, we had previously. And there is a um, very convenient way of doing it, but there are many mathematics involved. And uh, I don't want to go into details. If you are interested, you, you could check it out. There are a lot of tutorials introducing SIFT there. But it's a little bit beyond the topic today because I know not a student, they don't like the mathematics. But anyway, we have a very convenient way to calculate the contrast um, of that image. So uh, with this method, we can locate, uh, we, we can check it out for each of the candidates, uh, the local contrast. And so in that case, we can fill to a lot of weak extroma um, or low contrast points from the first batch of candidates we had. And here's the result you could see more intuitively. Um, here are previously some of the key points from the sky area. That part is the one with the low contrast. And uh, after that, they have been removed from the candidates. And also, um, there are some points previously are on that building, but with low contrast also has been removed from that image. For example, here are some of them. If you compare these local details, you, you will see that some of the key points ha have been removed um, from the candidates. And the second group of points we have to remove is those located on edges, because edges will naturally give us um, 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 greater uh, value uh, after DOG calculation. Uh, however, the edges uh, will naturally have that, but it doesn't mean they are silent in love, because um, an edges always appear um, in images, so they should not be considered as silent points. Otherwise, we just we were distracted by those edges. Um, so uh, to do that, um, SIFT also introduced a, a really convenient way using the Hessian matrix. The Hessian matrix is a way to calculating the gradients. We actually have introduced the local gradients at certain points. And this is uh, based on a really similar idea, but they're um, uh, converting the calculating in a convenient way. So um, for the same reason, I will skip the details. Anyway, you, you can just remember it can be calculated with uh, uh, the gradient calculated. It's easy to see that the, um, uh, we can locate if the candidates are on the edges or not. So uh, in that case, we can uh, uh, more specifically, the edges will have a high maxima and a low minima. Um, so uh, when it's at a color, it's with high maxima and minimal. Um, uh, value there. So with that observation, we can remove such kind of key points from the edges and colors there um, because they are not stable as well. So here's the result. You could see that some of the point on the edge has been removed like, like this has been removed. And those on the colors has been removed. And those uh, remaining key points are will be used as a final set of candidates of the key points. 
Uh, the next thing, because we already have the um, points, so next thing we have to do is to create a descriptor to describe the local the local features um, for each of the points. To do that, we are actually using the gradient again. Here you could see for each of the pixel, we could calculate uh, the gradients of its surrounding pixels in a certain in a certain region like this. So, um, as we used in previous lecture, the gradients can be calculated for each of the pixel. However, in Civ, we can put them together. Like uh, we can divide this region into sub-regions. Like here is a sub-region, and for each of region, we can summarize the gradients in that region. So after summarization, we only have probably only have one gradient representation there. So it will be used to represent that region. In that case, after we do this for different region, we could concate that representation as a histogram. So you could see from here, the histogram will tell us um, the orientation of that um, change. Uh, at a certain point. So, um, for example, here are some peaks there, um, and the one, the peak with the greatest value is considered the dominate, the dominate orientation of that point. That means the most of the change are following that direction. So, in that case, we, we know that uh, what uh, kind of features at that certain point uh, is. And sometimes we probably will have multiple peaks there in that image. In this case, we can create a representation for each of the peak. So, it, um, so here it's kind of different from the, our understanding about the feature extraction. Right now, uh, it's saying that we're, uh, when we have multiple uh, our uh, dominate orientations, we can create multiple feature descriptors at, at the same points. So here's the result for another image. You, you could see that we actually estimated uh, for each of point one uh, orientation. You could see it's actually represent how uh, the, pick, the values change. For example, here is a direction, and here's a change to this direction, to this direction. So, and with different scale, because the change have different degree. So um, that is an estimation of the scale of that change. So after the estimation of orientations, we can calculate the final descriptor of feature vector for each point. However, because the points have an orientation, uh, different orientation, so that means when uh, we are observing the same point, point as different viewpoints, they are pointed in that image in different direction. To address that problem, we can rotate the principal uh, orientation of that image. And so um, in case, and next time it's observed with a little bit uh, rotation like to here, then we can rotate it back to the same direction. Then all the features can be arranged based on this uh, rotated image. We can have the feature vector collected from different sub-regions. And this is idea. So here we could see for each of a point, we can create a local description by summarize the gradients and there. And at the same time, we're rotating the principal um, orientation uh, to the same. In that case, we have a feature vector uh, there. Like what's shown here, we can summarize this description into a feature vector as well, and um, it, which will tell us what it would be like at that certain point, I mean, the key points of that image. And um, 
uh, for each of the key points we have a descriptor there then we have a lab descriptor for that image telling us the local details of that image and also sometimes actually people are using the PCA uh, to filter out this description to create a more compact representation um, I'll skip that detail if you're interested you can check uh, using keywords like PCA shift or something to get the results and anyway you could see from here in um, the key point extracting works very well to find the local salient points the key points from that image and for each of them we uh, they are represented at different scale because as I mentioned the degree of the gradient change um, are different so actually to create the description as I mentioned uh, for each of the point you should use it at different scale mm, so um, in this way uh, you could have a better or stable representation for each of that points okay this is the shift uh, let's see some example here uh, from I'm here uh, here is a car so you look at those patterns of key point extracted under car right now we are looking at this picture at this direction and later we rotate them significantly those key points can be observed there that means they are actual uh, salient points of that car and those points can be actually used for describe the um, such details of that image and and hopefully it, it can be read by the computers as well and again um, here I would like to uh, refer you to this figure um, and to summarize we have global features and local features today we have introduced the color histogram and we have introduced LPP and the local features like the shift however there are other representative features so uh, if you're interested you can go check it out and there are actually a lot of features there and I just pick up several representative one used frequently in computer vision especially in the traditional computer vision Okay, thank you. That's all for today.